Good evening, folks. Welcome to Boston Virtual ARTCC's Oceanic Procedures Ground School on August the 17th. My name is Evan. I'm the Community Manager here at Boston Virtual ARTCC. I'm joined tonight by Krikor, a CFI. He'll be talking us through oceanic procedures. Now, this session is a little different than some of the ones we've discussed in the past couple of weeks, which have been very much specifically focused on IFR procedures, VFR operations in domestic U.S. airspace. Tonight, we're looking at stuff like cross the pond and events like the New York to Amsterdam crossfire or FNO or something that's coming up in a couple of days where there's a whole bunch of people leaving from Kennedy in the evening and then landing in Amsterdam the next morning. And so for anyone who's looking to fly in a route like that, to operate in oceanic airspace, whether it be part of an event or not. This session is designed to walk you through route planning, looking at how to deal with North Atlantic tracks, and looking at a whole variety of subjects that are unique to procedures for crossing the pond. So with that introduction out of the way, I'll hand things over to Krikor, who will walk us through the slides tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Evan. And thank everybody for joining us tonight. Hope you all had a, uh, a good start to the uh, the work week. And like Evan said, today we're going to primarily talk about oceanic flying. And this is fairly specific to the North Atlantic. Um, a number of other non-radar oceanic positions like the Pacific Ocean and uh, even the South Atlantic with, uh, with New York Radio and stuff have some slightly different procedures with a couple of variations that we may touch on, but we're not really going to focus on today. So we're really talking about going over the, the North Atlantic, um, talking about the planning process and how to find routes and, and how to program your FMS and get all that set up. Um, talk about oceanic theory. Why does it exist? Why are things different over the ocean? Um, and, and get a little bit into that. And then we're going to talk about radio operations and ATC procedures. So like Evan said, specifically geared towards events such as Cross the Pond or um, the upcoming FNO. Um, route planning is one of the more important parts of all of this. And it's also one of the harder parts, especially on VATSIM. In real life, you kind of just show up and you'll get a dispatch release that has your route and you don't need to really worry about it. Uh, but on VATSIM, you're largely responsible for finding your own route. Um, the domestic portion where you're over land or over the, the U.S. is usually the same. You'll find a standard route um, of which a number exists. You'll file a correct altitude for your direction of flight. Um, but in the oceanic environment, altitude is often how they separate you. So that whole northeast, odd, southwest, even kind of rule of thumb that we talk about kind of gets thrown out in oceanic. It doesn't really matter anymore because they separate tracks differently. And we'll, we'll get back to that in a couple minutes here. But the point is, you can get any altitude over the ocean. There's no wrong direction of flight, anything like that. Um, finding and filing routes is different and sometimes more challenging. Um, you're not able to go on FlightAware and just pull out an entire route um, because usually with international stuff, they hide it. And I'm not sure if that's a government thing or a FlightAware thing. Maybe they just don't have the data. Um, but oftentimes, you won't have the full route. Uh, sometimes, if you're departing the US and you're heading um, eastbound over to somewhere in Europe, then they may show you in FlightAware the entire route, including the the oceanic portion and the European portion. If you're going from Europe to the United States, you may see part of the route or you may not see any of it at all. So you have to go through some other sources. Um, we're going to talk about two. Uh, I One that's not on here, but I would strongly encourage is um, uh, uh, SimBrief. Sorry, I blanked there for a second, but SimBrief. Is, is pretty good. It normally will use real world tracks, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, but it is also able to put out accurate, complete routes. And usually you can just use what it has and you don't need to think about it or, or change too much with it. With that being said, another good one is Route Finder. Um, so there's a link here, rfinder.asalink.net slash free. The free part is the best part if you ask me, but I digress. Um, where you can essentially go in, you'll type your departure airport, so EGLL, which is London Heathrow, your arrival airport, which is KJFK, John F. Kennedy in New York, and an onward altitude. And it, usually it helps to put a range, um, in this case, between flight level 320 and flight level 400. Um, and then you can put the database, which is your specific ARAC cycle. It's basically telling you how current your navigational data is. So if there was a fix that got added to the database, you know, last month and you have data from four months ago, it's not going to show up. So having the correct database for what's in your simulator will make sure that you're able to actually fly the route. Um, you want to check use SIDs and use STARS because uh, it'll give you SID and STAR information or put you on one. Um, RNAV equipped, you, you pretty much need area navigation, which is going to be talked about in a later uh, ground school lesson. So if you don't know what that is, stay tuned and we'll talk about it. Um, 
and then tack and routes you can ignore. Nats need to be enabled. Nats is a North Atlantic track. That's what we're primarily going to focus on for the remainder of this slide, uh, slideshow rather. Um, so you're going to need that checked as well. So you, you punch all that in, you click on find route, um, and it will it will give you a route, which is what we're about to talk about. Uh, as well, during major events, some events like Cross the Pond, uh, and likely the FNO, although I don't know the details on that, um, they will predetermine routes and publish them somewhere. Forums, email, website, Discord, somewhere, uh, there will be a, a preferred route that they're going to want you to fly. So this step may be redundant. You, you may not need to do it in that case. But once you put that in, you hit enter, it's going to spit out a route for you. So this is an example of one. Um, you can see it gives us um, these track message identif identification, excuse me, TMIs, which we're going to get to in a minute, um, and then a computed route. So in this case, you have EGL, London Heathrow. It just says SID. So this is one of the limitations with R-Finder is it's not going to give you a specific departure. It won't say, you know, UMLAT 3 Tango or whatever your specific departure is. It just says SID. So you've got to figure that out. UMLAT, a bunch of airways. Uh, BAGSO, Direct Resno, and then NAT-A, NATA. Um, that's pronounced NAT-A, North Atlantic Track Alpha. We're going to come back to what this means. 2DEP, November 396 Alpha, that's a North Atlantic route, so North Atlantic Route 396 Alpha, Alex, Q822, Kennebunk, Star, JFK. So again, it's not going to tell you Parch 3 Arrival, it just says Star. So this isn't the end all, there's still a little bit of adjusting that you need to do. So we can break this down a little bit more into a couple different sections. You've got the European domestic section, which takes us all the way to BAGSO. Um, like we said, or like I said, rather, EGLL SID just means you need to determine the SID to use. It's not figuring that out for you. That's one of the advantages to a resource like Simbrief, where it actually will automatically figure out, hey, you need the Omelette 3 Tango departure, or, or whatever it is. I don't know what it is at a Heathrow. Um, uh, yeah, and and most of them are runway dependent, so... Or, um, yeah, runway dependent. So like in the US where we have, you know, the Sox 5 departure out of Boston, theirs are the same thing. It's named after a fix and then there's a number, but they have a specific letter at the end that determines the runway that's in use. So like the Compton 3 Foxtrot or 3 Golf, same departure procedure, just off of different runways. That's one difference between international airspace and the US. NAT A, uh, North Atlantic Trek is what NAT stands for. Um, they get abbreviated with a letter. This stands, it represents a whole bunch of additional information, which we'll get to on the next slide. North Atlantic Route, or NAR, uh, is what this N396A is. It's basically an airway that connects the exit point for the NAT track, which is 2DEP in this case, with a d common domestic fix, so Alex in this case. And these routes, these airways usually only have one or two fixes on them, and they mostly go through Moncton and Gander, uh, domestic airspace up in Canada. Um, but there are a, there's a whole slew of them. If you were to open it up on, on Sky Vector, there's just a, a kind of crazy number of them out there. But they have the same thing, N, a bunch of letter, uh, numbers, excuse me, and then a, a letter, which is can change. And it's pronounced North Atlantic Route 396 Alpha. And then you have the U.S. domestic portion, which in this case takes you from Alex, which is on the boundary of Boston Center and the Moncton FIR, and then takes you down a normal arrival route into Kennedy, um, once again, it just says star. You need to determine what arrival to use. In this case, the parch three would be preferred, uh, and it is not runway dependent, so you don't have those goofy letters at the end of it. So let's talk a little bit about North Atlantic tracks. Um, so transatlantic flights from the north, uh, sorry, the U.S.'s northeast area over to Western Europe and and back. Um, they're pre-established routes, and they get published every day. So there's a bunch of people who are way smarter than. Than, than I am certainly, and they go and they look at the weather and the wind and the different entry and exit points, and they come up with a bunch of routes that are optimized. So based on the wind forecast, they find what the most efficient way to cross the ocean would be. Sometimes they have a lot of arc to them and they go very far north, sometimes they're far south, sometimes they're in just a straight line going across, um, but it's all based on on winds, and they'll, they figure all that out. And then once a day they published it. Um, it gives you the, the, the quickest time to go in either direction. They're named A to Z. All of them have alphabetical identifiers, NAT A, NAT B, NAT C, whatever the case is. Um, and all the entry and exit points are the same. So there's going to be, uh, there's a, a number of maps you can find if you want to look into it some more, but there's a whole set of, you know, 10 or 15 or 20, however many entry points and exit points on each side of the ocean. And you're always going to enter or exit the... Um, 
the NAT track on one of those fixes. It's just the waypoints in between that change. Um, they are generally available for all RVSM uh, altitudes, which is reduced vertical separation minima. There are some additional operating requirements to qualify with that on VATSIM. We just assume that everybody has that capability. So essentially 29,000 through 41,000 feet is generally what these routes are available on. Occasionally, there will be restrictions placed on the routes, which we'll look at here in a minute. Um, but usually, you just assume that all of those um, altitudes are accessible. Now, you're probably wondering why. What, what's the point in all this crazy, complicated setup? And it, it boils down to the curvature of the Earth. Um, ATC doesn't have radar coverage over the ocean. Um, and that's true for most major bodies of water. There's There's not a way of... Putting a radar there, radar is dependent on the line of sight. You need to be able to draw a line from the, the the radar to the airplane, you know, tie a string between the two of them and have nothing in between it. Um, so it's not possible to have actual radar coverage over the water. And for those of you who remember or paid attention, this is part of what factored into us losing um, Malaysia Flight 370 a couple of years ago. Um, it was in a non-radar area and there wasn't a way of tracking it. With that being said, ADSB, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, and ADSC are becoming more commonplace and more reliable. So some areas, uh, including the North Atlantic, actually, are beginning to use ADSB as a alternative means. So instead of relying on the stuff that we're talking about today with position reports, they use the GPS uh, ADSB return via satellite um, to to get that information between the airplane and the um the, the air traffic controllers. I said two years ago when we last ran this presentation that the next time we run it, we're going to be talking about a whole different set of things because it's all going to be ADSB and it's going to be the equivalent of radar separation. We're not 100% of the way there yet, but we're getting very close. I don't think the VATSIM network is simulating ADSB yet. I believe the last cross the pond was typical traditional position reports, but I'd like to think that two years from today, you're going to see that uh, Nav Canada, which is the Canadian version of the FAA when it comes to air traffic control, is basically leading, leading the charge in this area. In fact, they've actually launched their own satellites to support it. And the idea is that in probably the next two years, you'll see a drastic change to how the North Atlantic operates. We've seen tremendous change even in the last 10 or 15 years going from these very structured North Atlantic tracks to much more random routing and much more flexibility, that's only going to increase. And I think eventually you're going to see the equivalent of radar separation over the North Atlantic, making it a lot easier for operators to fly different routes in the future. Yeah, that's a great point. And they've actually already started implementing this in the North Atlantic. And it's right now the way they're doing it is they're basically taking the, the previous separation they needed and just cutting it in half. Um, which when you're talking about 60 miles, that makes a pretty significant difference, but they're, they're still working on improving the system and making it more reliable. So how do you program NAT A into an FMS? Um, the NAT track with that letter, so A, B, C, whatever it is, right? It's really just a code. It, it represents a bunch of other stuff. It's a shortcut, if you will. So you can go to notums.faa.gov slash common slash nat.html. That's an FAA website, right? This is real data. This isn't uh, VATSIM specific. And it's going to spit out this. So you'll see North Atlantic tracks last updated 2020-08-11. So this was six days ago. 16-11 GMT, which is Zulu time. And then it lists the, the tracks. So kind of like a, a METAR or TAF or whatever, there's a, a code to it where you need to decode this, right? So... Um, it starts with a identifier at the top, and I'm blanking on what that means. Evan, do you remember? I'm sorry, which identifier are we talking about here? 102013? Nope. Okay. Well, I don't remember what that means, but it means something. EGGX, ZOZX, basically the, the facilities that are publishing this, um, that's the... Uh, 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 Shanwick, I'm sorry, radio station in the UK. Um, so, NAT 1-1 tracks, so this is the tracks are available from flight level 310 to 390 inclusive, so anything 31 to 39,000 feet is available. August 11 at 11.30 Zulu to August 11 at 1900 Zulu, so they're only available during these times. After that, they're going to change. Uh, part 1, track A, so A is right there. Resno, 5520, 5530, 5440, 5250, 2 depth. That's kind of confusing. So what is that? 
it's basically saying all the waypoints. So Resno is a fix, right? That's a, something you plug into your FMS or GPS, whatever you have, um, and it knows where that is. It corresponds to a set of lat longs, but we identify it with Resno. All of these numbers, where it's two numbers, a slash, and then two numbers, are basically, um, excuse me, um, GPS coordinates. So it corresponds to 55 degrees north and 20 degrees west. It's literally lat... Oh, excuse me, I apologize. Um, it, it literally corresponds to latitude and longitudes. How you program that into your FMS is going to change with every airplane. Um, some are different than others, and you need to look in the manual for your FMS or a, a quick Google to figure out how that works. But most flight sim companies know that people, especially ones like PMDG who make long-haul airplanes, they know that this is what people are going to use them for. So they'll have some form of guidance in their manuals for this. Um, going down here, east levels nil. So if you're heading eastbound, so from the US to the UK, you cannot use track alpha right now. So actually, I think in the example, we use this and now it, it wouldn't really work. But anyway, um, this is only a westbound track. And then if you're going westbound, you can use flight level 350, 60, 70, 380, or 390. So anything yeah, our between... example was, was westbound, right? It was Europe to US. Yeah, so, so that would... Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, it's basically saying if you can use this track if you're going westbound at any of those altitudes. Um, and then there's some remarks. One thing that's down here is the TMI. So we're going to talk about this when you request a clearance here in a minute. But when you request a clearance, you need to provide the controller with your TMI, which is an identifier. It actually corresponds to the day of the year that these charts or that these uh, tracks rather were published on. So in this case, they were published on the 224th day of the year. And the reason that they care about that is since track alpha exists all year round, they just use different waypoints. That's their way of making sure you're using the correct track alpha. That's how you confirm that you're, you're flying the same set of lat longs that the controller thinks you're flying. Um, so let's see, Matt asks if the, the track is inclusive from flight level 310 to 390, why are some of those only available? So that's a good question. I believe the stuff at the top refers to the, the entire publication as far as all of the different NATs. This is only showing track alpha. So if we were to go to that FAA website and scroll down, there'd be more tracks and they should be valid from 310 to 390. It's just track alpha specifically is only from 350 to 390. And sometimes it could also be that, and it may not be the case here, but sometimes the eastbound traffic may be using some of those lower levels if for whatever reason they've decided to stack the NATs. Pretty unlikely they do that. We're also, we're going to see this in a future slide, we're in a pretty weird scenario right now where only one NAT is actually being published for each direction because of the reduced traffic and the increase in random routing. That's a that's you know up until the beginning of this year that was a very uncommon thing to see. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But it, it's, as, as Krikor says, either due to the fact that another track might be using those altitudes, uh, possibly in another direction, or it, it could simply be that they've elected to only use certain altitudes, again, because of a concern with respect to separation and air, air traffic control, staffing, manpower, given all that's going on in the world right now. Yeah. And then another thing is operators are generally encouraged to fly st a strategic lateral offset procedure or SLOP, which is essentially where, and there's a way of programming this in the FMS, and again, it'll depend on your specific FMS uh, uh, company and, and how that model works. But you basically fly a couple miles offset intentionally to avoid wake turbulence or traffic conflicts. And there are specific requirements um, as far as how far you're able to go, what direction you're able to go, stuff like that. And you can find more information on this from a couple of online um, sources. Um, let's see, Chuck Oman asks, in real world, tracks change at zero Zulu and 12 Zulu, so for non-event oceanic VATSIM flying, do people fly real time or eastbound night and westbound day routes and corresponding tracks observed? And that's a, that's a good question. It's a little bit of a complicated answer. So there's a couple parts to this. One, they will often have, when they, so for the first portion of the day from zero Zulu to 12 Zulu, the, F, the FAA and, and all of them will normally publish a number of tracks going eastbound, but maybe only one track or none going westbound. During normal times, I'm not talking COVID with everything that's going on right now. Um, other times they may, so from like 12 Zulu back around to zero Zulu, they may publish a bunch going the other direction and only one back to the east. So um, on VATSIM, it's generally accepted as long as you're flying one of the current tracks. If there is a confusion about what 
track you're on, the controller should follow up with you on that, and they may just have to have you clarify all the waypoints. Um, it, it's one of those use your judgment type scenarios. Vatsim is a little bit of an exception because we don't have the resources that the real world does. And Krikor, while we're on the just on the slide here, that code you're referring to at the top of the message, so the 10 2013, I've had a look and that would be the day of the month and then the time it was issued. So this would be the 10th of August at 2013, Zulu. Oh, there you go. The one I just went on to the current one, for example, and uh, looked like this, you know, same thing. You've got 17 and then 1259, Zulu, indicating it was published today at 1259, Zulu. Gotcha. That makes sense. Thank you. So, yeah, this is what Evan was talking about. So 2020, co uh, sorry, 2020 operations. So normally there's a number of tracks in each direction, something like six. I don't remember the exact number. Um, due to COVID-19, there's not a lot of traffic flying. Um, all the air traffic control facilities are on reduced staffing. And um, there's also just not a lot of airplanes. So they have only started publishing one track in either direction, um, which is really all you're going to see right now is one, maybe two tracks. The, what this has led to is most operators basically saying, well, there's no point going way out of our way to fly that one track. So they just file a random routing. And so here's an example of a flight from, excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, I just got back from dinner. Um, as an example of a flight from Vancouver to London Heathrow. And you can see in the route section in bold there on the bottom right, there's a whole slew of latitude and longitudes, um, which are written out a little bit differently than we saw in the Nats, but they mean the same thing. Um, and they'll just fly that instead. And that's perfectly acceptable as well. Um, the biggest thing is they have a, a fix every, um, uh, every degree that they go, um, actually, sorry, every 10 degrees east or west that they move. Um, there's some oceanic planning charts that kind of show all those fixes. It's essentially a grid, but, but that's what all of that is there. So now that you've flight planned and you understand kind of how you're going to get across the ocean, it's time to request a clearance. Your initial IFR clearance that you'd get on the ground, right, with clearance delivery, you're doing that exactly the same as you normally would. However, to go over the North Atlantic specifically, you need a separate clearance, which is typically obtained in the air. The only exception to this would be if you're departing uh, Ireland or if you're departing like the very eastern edge of Canada, like St. John's and out in Newfoundland and that kind of area. Generally, you have to, you know, let's say you're, you're flying up. Once you're more than 30 minutes, but within an hour of entering oceanic airspace, you're going to talk to your, you know, Moncton Center Controller or Gander Center, whichever you are, and say, you know, hey, request off frequency for, you know, five minutes to obtain oceanic clearance. Um, and they're going to approve that. And you're going to go over and talk to uh, either Shanwick or Gander Oceanic, uh, depending on what side you're on. So this is an example um, off to the right here uh, that was taken, I believe, off the Cross the Pond website. And so Evan and I will um, kind of sound this one out for you. Evan, would you rather be the pilot or the controller? I'll take controller so you can use your wonderful British accent. <laughs> um, okay. Not to put I'm, you on the spot. I, 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 I was... See if you've been practicing. It's more Australian than it is British. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm just going to use my, my not as interesting normal voice. Um, so it says Oceanic. It's it's actually radio is the uh, terminology you would use there. But Shamwick Oceanic or Shamwick Radio, Speedbird 123, request clearance to Kennedy International. Speedbird 123, pass your message. Speedbird 123, request Kennedy International via Nat Alpha, Sunot 5820, 5... Uh, Nine north three zero west five nine north four zero west five nine or north five zero west prawn direct Yankee Delta Papa at flight level three seven zero mock decimal eight two estimate sunot time one five zero eight Zulu TMI zero seven five and SoCal's Charlie Sierra Alpha Romeo Speedbird one two three. Speedbird one two three cleared track Alpha to Kennedy at flight level three seven zero mock point eight two. Cross Sunot, not before time 1503 Zulu. Clarence expires Sunot, time 1513 Zulu. 
Clear to Kennedy by track Alpha cross Senate, not before time 1503 Zulu. Clearance expires Senate time 1513 Zulu. Speedbird 123. Speedbird 123, stand by for Cell Cal check. Charlie Sierra, Alpha Romeo. And we'll talk about what Cell Cal is here in a minute, but once you've received that message, Cell Cal received Speedbird 123. Speedbird 123, continue with domestic. Back to domestic, Speedbird 123. And so at this point, you would go over to, um, back over to, uh, Gander, like we were talking about before, and you would just tell them, you know, hey, we're back on frequency. Um, Chuck asks for non-oceanic flying. Uh, is Sh if Shamrock and Gander is on offline, sorry, just use the best track you can find. And the answer is, yeah, if they're offline, there's no one to make position reports to. So um, it kind of, again, you have to use your judgment and pick something that looks good and try and coordinate with other traffic. There's a lot on these clearances, uh, including the ones we're going to look at later. So it helps to have a pen and paper and write this down. There's somewhere on the Cross the Pond website, which has changed like six times in the last year, but somewhere on the website, there's a form um, that has this example and it has a um, kind of a, a template for the oceanic communications. And that's a really good resource to have physically in front of you to write down on so you don't forget anything. Um, we mentioned CELCAL, which stands for Selective Call. It's basically a four... Uh, most oceanic airplanes have a four-letter code that has some specific requirements that we're not going to get into. Um, but it'll send a two-tone signal over HF radio, a uh, high-frequency radio. Um, and it basically tells the pilot that ATC wishes to contact them. So if you're over the ocean, like, you're making about a position report every hour. You're not doing a whole lot, and pilots really don't want to be sitting there with the radio up listening to everyone drone on with those long clearances that we just did. Um, so they Most usually... HF radio has got a ton of static on it. And it's a yes. pain to listen to. That is also a very good point. So usually they'll just turn the radio all the way down, and if they hear the cell cal code, which is, you can think of it like a real-life version of a contact me message from ATC, um, they'll turn, the, turn it back up, and, and that's when they'll um, talk, essentially. Some pilot clients model cell cal pretty well, like it'll actually make the tone. Some not quite as well. It depends on your specific client, and some controllers just send a private message and pretend it's cell cal. Um, like we do with the PDC. So once you enter Oceanic airspace, you're going to be told to contact Oceanic Control, so Shanwick Radio or Gander Radio. Um, air Traffic Control will tell you radar service terminated, squawk 2000. Now, it really doesn't matter what you squawk because there's no radar, so ATC is not going to see it. So they kind of just give you 2000 as a good, like, generic code, and that way you don't mess with somebody who's over a domestic airspace. Um, you have to give position reports. At this point, if you don't tell ATC where you are and what you're doing, they have no way of knowing. Like, there could be someone out in the middle of the ocean goofing off in a skyhawk, and they'd never know. Um, cell cal will be used, like we just talked about, whenever ATC needs to get in touch with you. Uh, if there's any delays or changes or anything like that, then you'll need to tell ATC. And on VETSIM, you can't use time compression. Uh, when ATC is online, unless you talk to them. And that's the same everywhere. That's not just an oceanic thing. But air traffic controllers on the oceanic side of things have to do everything based on time. Separation requirements are generally in terms of time, not distance in oceanic airspace. So if you are using time compression, they don't really have any way of separating you, which is kind of the point of all of this. Um, so position reports become your new thing that you have to do. So every time you cross a waypoint in oceanic airspace, you need to tell ATC. Um, VATSIM has recently come up with a new text-based system called NATTRACK that was in use for the last one or two cross the ponds. I don't remember. I haven't used it, but supposedly it's pretty good. Um, there's also an oceanic clearance generator that you can use on the Gander Oceanic website just as a, a resource to help, uh, help you expect what to get. And there's a position report generator, which does the same thing. And it's similar to that sheet that I was telling you about where you can plug in all your information and it'll kind of help tell you what to say, which can be really useful. So here's an example of a position report. Uh, Evan can be our, our uh, fantastic controller again here. Uh, and uh, we'll go through this. So uh, Shanwick, Speedbird123 with position report. Speedbird123, go ahead with your position report. Speedbird 123 reporting 58 North 20 West time 1532 Zulu, flight level 370 and Mach decimal 82. Estimating 39 North 30 West time 1619 or Zulu, 59 North 40 West thereafter. Speedbird 123. Speedbird 123, Shamwick copied your report of 58 
north two zero west time one five three two zulu flight level three seven zero mock decimal eight two estimating five nine or north three zero west time one six one nine or zulu five nine or four zero north after and the raid back's correct speedbird one two three so what's happening there is you're basically giving atc all your information you're telling them where you just passed the time you passed it uh altitude mock number your next fix so where you're going to now when you're expecting to get there and then your following waypoint. And the reason that ATC reads that all back is they need to make sure that's correct. If they get a number wrong or they get a time wrong or anything like that, that can be the difference between making a sandwich with another airplane or getting to your destination safely. So um, that's why they read that back, and that's why you have to confirm that their readback is correct. Um, this is also interesting, a little bit of a tidbit. This isn't a VATSIM thing, but in the real world, when the pilot makes this position report, they're giving it to a radio operator, not the controller. So the radio operator is actually going to go ahead and type in all this information and give it to the air traffic controller. If the controller wants something to happen, they're actually going to have to tell the radio operator who's then going to relay it to the pilot. So there's an extra step in the middle that it doesn't exist on VATSIM, but that, that's how it works in the real world. So just kind of interesting fact there. I thought it was interesting. Anyway, um, when you leave oceanic airspace, um, you're going to need to reestablish radar contact um, with either... Uh, Shannon in, in Ireland or Gander in um, Canada. Uh, once you have been told radar contact, the same as in any domestic IFR environment, uh, you don't need to get position reports anymore. Um, you also don't need to cancel IFR clearance because you never, like you were operating under IFR the entire time and you're still operating under IFR. That oceanic clearance you received was not an IFR clearance that needs to be canceled. It was a oceanic clearance. Um, and it is essentially automatically canceled as you leave, much like an IFR flight plan at a towered airport. Um, charts for outside the U.S. can be hard to find. Um, there are a couple good resources that Evan just linked. ChartFox is a really good one that has a VATSIM login and, and has international charts for all over the world. Um, you also can register with Eurocontrol and get real world charts for almost everywhere in Europe at that Eurocontrol link that Evan just sent. Um, there are some high altitude planning charts that are available on Sky Vector and, and other resources. Um, and Navigraph now provides real charts. And one thing I'd like to point out, so down here we have, uh, oh, actually, next slide, sorry. Um, I'll get to that in a sec then. Uh, government charts look different everywhere, um, depending on the country you're in and who creates the charts. Uh, Jeppesen, which is what a lot of real world airlines will use, and other formats provide a constant chart format, no matter where you are in the world. So here, here's a, a good example. On the left, we have a departure chart, uh, the one we talked about earlier, the Compton departure out of London Heathrow. And that's a, um, I think it's NATS, ironically, which it stands for something else, but whatever the, yeah. the British provider is. And on the right is a FAA government chart for the departure the arrival into Kennedy. One's a departure, one's an arrival, but they have the same format regardless. Um, SIDS and star charts look the same. With that being said, there are many obvious differences. It's not just the color. The way lines are depicted is different. The information is different, um, like over each NDB and VOR and stuff like that. Um, these are completely different charts. And if you're used to one, you're probably going to struggle with the other. One nice thing about Jeppesen charts, which is what... Navigraph has switched to in recent years, they look the same. So on the left is the same departure from Jeppesen out of Heathrow, and on the right is the same arrival into Kennedy from Jeppesen. And what you'll notice, the formats are the same. You've got the same box of information at the top with frequencies and notes. You've got all of your uh, routing portions of the chart. Altitude restrictions are in blue, so they're very easy to identify. You can see here, like we have to cross uh, the London 11 DME between 6,000 and 3,000. Over here, you can kind of see it on the right at trait. There's a, a flight level 240 restriction, but those are consistently formatted. Um, and, and actually, this is a side note, but um, on both the FAA and the Jeppesen charts, you can actually see all the endpoints for those North Atlantic routes on the chart as well, which is kind of cool. Anyway, with that being said, the big advantage to something like Navigraph is the charts look the same no matter where in the world you are. Um, so if you get used to one format, you'll be able to apply that knowledge elsewhere, which you can't do necessarily if you're using government charts. And so that's pretty much it, guys. Um, oceanic flying is is weird and complicated. It's something that not a lot of people have even real-world experience with until you start doing the long-haul flights. Um, so it's it's easy to get confused and, and uh, 
uh, whatnot with it. So hope you guys have enjoyed and maybe learned a thing or two. Um, and um, sorry, I, I blanked there for a minute. Um, but I hope you guys have enjoyed and maybe learned a thing or two. Um, we'll be back next week to talk about holds and then get into some more domestic IFR stuff. Um, but if you guys have any questions uh, that haven't been answered as it pertains to oceanic flying, uh, Evan and I will will stick around for a little bit and try and, and help out with some of that. And yeah, that's pretty much it. These next four sessions, they cover a lot of the really complex IFR stuff. So we get a little bit more into the detail. The next one in particular, where we go through holds, that goes into a lot of detail on how to do your hold entries, timing, corrections for wind, all kinds of things that even our new wings program doesn't go into in a whole lot of detail because of that complexity. Then we go through approach plates. We're looking at things like how do you determine transitions, full approaches, feeder routes. RNAV actually gives a full example of how to descend via an arrival. So some really interesting stuff coming up for the IFR simulator pilot. I'm going to pause the recording here, and then we can stick around for any more questions that you guys might have. As Krikor says, we'll be back next time to talk about holds. And until then, we hope you've enjoyed today's presentation and hope you're enjoying our new wings program and the ATC that we've had on the network over the past couple of days.